Hello, and welcome to another Lived Quality Conversation on the Lived Quality Podcast. And today I'm privileged again to be speaking with Wana. Uh, Wana has been on the podcast before, and we've spoken about many interesting things. Uh, Wana is an educator, she's a coach, and uh, she's a nursing practitioner, and a parent as well. And she does many things. Uh, if you've watched some of the previous episodes, you would know a lot of a lot about Wana by now. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to see you, Wana. And if I was to ask you, how have you been? Uh, what's what I've been thinking about? What's alive for you? Uh, what would you say? Hey, Clay, it's great great to be with you as always. Um, what am what have I been thinking about? Well. Um, I suppose I'm doing well overall, Uh, as with everyone, you get challenges in life and you get, um, you know, certain times where you reevaluate what your life is about and think of where you're going. Um, So I've kind of had one of those weeks, I think, uh, overall, just where I'm sort of thinking about the future and, um, yeah, and it's sort of come about because I did have that interview we spoke about in one of our last podcasts. and that really, I think it was just sort of a, a sign of what has been sort of bubbling within me, just um, looking at what I can do to make a greater impact and um, influence others uh, with the passion that I have for life and for the things that I'm in, enjoying and involved in. Um, so, yeah, it's just I'm at that point where I'm just like thinking about life and what's the meaning of everything that we do and how do we transition from one season to the next? What does that look like? Um, because for me, it's looked very different in different seasons. Mm-hmm. So just sort of uh, taking your time to uh, be more conscious and aware of what's going on and what's unfolding for you and uh, yet trying to your best to stay with it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And just figuring out, like, I think with every turn we make, you want to reevaluate where your values lie and identify if you're headed in the direction of your values or not. Um, I think for myself, I do because I tend to really want to live a quality life and not just make another decision just to seek another high or, you know, just to say that I've done something or accomplished something, but to really focus in and hone in on what is it that I value that um is pulling to to me um so i of i believe that when you're living in with intention um you find your purpose and in every season that purpose can look different so i'm just you know wanting to live authentically to my purpose um rather than to my ego um and my likes or dislikes or you know what's easy necessarily yeah, and, and for me, like when I hear values, uh, I'm also quickly reminded of needs. I was chatting with a friend this morning and um, <clears throat> she messaged me and said uh, something to the effect of, um, I am having a peaceful day and it feels really great. And and so we chatted a little bit about that. and. Um, we got to a place where we discovered that it seems as if that um, peace only comes when you've dealt with uh, all the the needs within you that are going to uh, steal it from you, if I may call it that way. Mm-hmm. Because you, whenever you're not meeting those needs, they're going to express themselves to you in a way that sort of like gives you you know, it's, they send you a signal such that you can pay attention to them. It's going to be some pain or some anxiety of some kind. And um, without addressing them, without addressing that escalation, uh, you will lose your peace. And for you to to regain it, you have to address those, you know, inner needs. They may even be external, but they, like they're... There are certain needs that have to be met before a peaceful state can be earned, and uh, and so I was uh, I was meditating upon that, and it was quite um, very very 
interesting for me because I hadn't thought about it that way before because, uh, you know, you just think like, you know, you, you think life's happening and, and, and you can manage, uh, some of these things and suppress some of the needs, but, uh, they always come back in strange ways. It's, it's as if you have to, uh, you have to learn to parent your needs and your needs and desires and sort of if you're not uh, addressing them if you're not dealing with them and uh you know relating with them then mm-hmm. it's likely that they're going to sort of take on a life of their own and um you know direct your life in a different direction uh that you may not want in some cases <clears throat> and this may seem to you like something that is happening out of the blue like you may res- you you may um experience it in such a way that puts you in a situation where you go oh my god what's happening where am i how did i end up in this scenario uh experiencing this how did all this come to be and and partly that is when you're not you've not been sort of like paying attention to it or being respectful of those needs. So, yeah, it's, it's like we have to respect ourselves and take take those things that are rising seriously. Otherwise, they're going to get us and put us in situations that uh, we don't want to end up in. I don't know. What are some of your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, and I really um, appreciate what you've shared on that because um, – I think, well, in Alethea, what I learned uh, is that when we don't address those needs or when we're not paying attention to those needs, um, there's that compensation that steps in. And the compensation often is that we will go uh, about a different way to uh, perhaps specify that need. Rather than meet the need or identify what the need is seeking from us, um, we may land in a behavior that is less than um, pleasant. And so we see a lot of people that would go to, you know, different things that fill our life, like substance abuse, or maybe it's becoming OCD about your cleaning or whatever it is, maybe shopping or um, just these other habits that often give us the high or um, they give us this false illusion that we're meeting the need that we have. um, But essentially, we're not meeting the need at its root. And so identifying the need and then being present with that need to identify where it's com- it comes from. But also, what is the seeking? What is the reason that this is showing up in my life? Um, and in different seasons, different things will show up because we are always transitioning. And I think that's important to identify. You know, there's that verse that says that the sons of Korah knew the times. And so I think um, I often reflect on that because it's important for us to know our times. It's important for us to know what we often refer to as seasons, right? You're going through seasons, you're going through changes. Uh, you know, when you have small children, there's a that's a season and it only lasts for so long and then you've got all the children and, and that's a different season. And so it requires different things, different um, energy. Uh, it requires different um, operation from you in terms of how you do things and how you think about life and what is important and valued at that time. Um, so. I really appreciate that, you know, we have um, this value for for our needs. I think often we don't meet our needs um, in a healthy manner or really know how to meet our needs. I mean, we find people all the time that, you know, will say, oh, just, I just felt this thing and I just went with it and then, you know, it was, it was wrong and landed me here. And I think we don't really understand what the job of our needs or their role is in our life. And so we can often fill it quickly with something that's instant that relieves us of that pressure or that nagging that our Mm. needs often bring um but then leaves us uh chasing the next tie and the next tie and it just gets a a little more addictive each time and we have to go to a higher dose and so it becomes more destructive to our life and so i i tend to yeah ask the question of myself and especially as i'm going through the coaching course um really finding out what is it that are my needs at the moment, but, but what's yearning within me? What's that mm. call within me? Cause you know, sometimes we feel lonely or sometimes we may feel like we're, um, you know, like I'm in this season where I'm really feeling like I just need to make a difference. And I just want something, um, that gives back 
right? Mm. I want to be doing something that gives back and honors other people and um, sees people out of their suffering. And I can't explain that sensation within me, but sitting with it and meditating or what it is that it's trying to get me to, um, I think has been really key for me in this season to not brush it away, not, you know, go to the mall and satisfy my needs and be like, oh, I'm fine. It will go away. Um, pacify that call, but just be present to Id- identify and understand what's its greater purpose. Mm. Why is it that I, I, you know, I um, have the desire to give back and to be of use to somebody else and to make a difference in someone else's life. Um, and I think essentially what that does is allows us to live a fulfilled life um, mm. because at different points in our life, our mission and our, um, you know, our call changes it's going to look different um, as we give of ourselves and as we're intentional to utilize the time here on earth wisely to make the difference that we were called to make, um, you know, reach our destiny. And, and of course, that's part of your personal goals as well. It's not to neglect that you as a human being and individual have preferences and have goals and have things that you want to achieve in life. Uh, but I think ultimately it comes to giving back and being present or being able to um, you know, bring a solution to someone else's life and bring a solution to someone else's problems um, that I think gives us the greatest satisfaction. So I tend to sit with a lot of that emotion now and just question it and really get curious about what it is that um, it's helping me to do or to draw towards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's really good because, um, you know, while you're sharing that, um, it, it, it seems to me like... <clears throat> Like the the things we end up valuing, um, they sort of rise up to the top. Like they'll bubble up uh, as we as we start to identify <clears throat> some of the things that uh, help us maintain, you know, the optimal place we need to be, such that we can maybe continue getting to those things we value the most. For example, like with this friend of mine, I was asking them that you know what did you notice about you know you say you're in a very peaceful state right now and you're really having such a wonderful time but what do you notice about what's going on around you so that you can know next time if you're not in that situation what you need to look for and most of the time we neglect to do that but it's it's really it's really key that when you're in a, a situation that you feel is optimal, it, it's like, and we spoke about work before, it's like there's still work to be done, right? Like there's still work, you know, noticing work, like paying at, uh, attention and awareness to how that feels like and what that looks like so that you know what to work towards next time. Like if you have to address, uh, you know, needs will always arise and they will always get you in some form or another, and they will throw you out of that peaceful state. Uh, but if you know what it, that peaceful state looks like or where it is, then you know what to walk towards. It's like, oh, it's, and you don't get uh, discouraged because sometimes uh, we we can get trapped in, in a place of discouragement just because something uh, kicked us out of where we wanted to be or the place we wanted to be. And, and and we get so crushed and, and go like, I'll never try again. Uh, that's it. How, how, how could this happen? Uh, but if you did notice that actually you were, you were able to do that, then, then it means there's a way to do it again. And so you, you have to be aware of what, it, what are these things that are arising and how are they, you know, influencing how you're, you're situated. Because we, we live in a situational life, like, you know, the situation is always changing. And some of those situations that are changing around us, yes, we do have a hand in them. Uh, but there's many that we don't have a hand in. Uh, however, we have to deal with. We have to have that flexibility of shaping ourselves to an ever-changing environment such that we can continue to deal with it and we can continue to be in it. And that will only happen if we learn to work with it and be aware uh, of it and and pay that attention, you know, uh, 
to how it's shifting, the little nuances that are changing and how that's impacting us. Uh, another interesting thing that, you know, has been happening of late, like, you know, I've, I've learned to sort of like pay attention to my mood changes, right? Like it's, it's even, even when your environment, let's say <clears throat> is, uh, is going as it, would say normally happen like things are happening as they would normally happen the way you you feel in that time and space in that moment is going to shift and vary and sometimes that may be the thing that undoes uh your stability and so it's like the changes the change could come from outside or it could come from inside uh, but you need to be aware of it like when the change happens where is it coming from is it inside is it outside and uh, how do I deal with it? And and that's where I find um, what's his name Ken Wilber's quadrants. Uh, they come in quite quite useful there because then you know using them as a guide, you can then decide is it an I space type thing where I have something that I need to do, or is it a we space thing whereby it's a shared contribution, or is it an it or it's that. Is something I just have to learn to work with, you know, something like the weather, right? Uh, do I bring an umbrella or do I do I not? <laughs> it's, it's, it boils down to that. The weather is going to happen the way the weather happens. Um, yeah, and so some of those, those are some of the thoughts that came up for me. Yeah, and I really like the quadrants. I was actually um, reviewing them this week because um, I have them open on my browser. And what I appreciate is the ability to see where these emotions are coming from and how they're um, rising up. Um, and in coaching, what we were taught was that emotions will come and go just like clouds. We're just a you know, container, I suppose, that it goes through. And so allowing those emotions to pass. But as you mentioned, it's really difficult when we find ourselves in circumstances where everything's going great and we don't necessarily want to change anything. But then all of a sudden we're feeling this emotion that is like, not in line with how the environment around us or externally is looking, right? Everything's going great. Maybe you're at a birthday party or whatever and everyone's happy and all of a sudden you just have this sensation of like maybe feeling angry, upset, lonely, and you're like, why am I feeling like this all of a sudden? But realizing where that sensation or emotion is arising from I think is really important and it draws us back to, or for myself, it, it calls me back to being present, being present to recognize what's arising and perhaps then being curious to identify maybe the reasons for which this is arising. And again, going back to the quadrants, is there something of me? Is there something with, within me that's at this present moment being triggered, um, that's being awakened? Or is there something happening in the environment that just triggered that thing and maybe there's a reason for it and I need to get curious to identify what triggers this thing and why is it triggered at this very time um so yeah there's there's so much to learn about ourselves and just the depth of how we experience life is just i think incredible and i feel like sometimes you know you can learn so much uh and it can feel overwhelming and you just feel like am i ever gonna get this am i ever gonna reach a point where you know i can just deal in a good day deal with all of the emotions that arise and understand and be curious and 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 stay in the present moment um, and sort of have a, you know, like relatively successful day in terms of how I handle myself and how I show up to the world and show up for myself with integrity and all the values that I hold. Um, yeah, I think those are challenging. Uh, and especially as I'm getting older, I'm like, oh, there's still so much work to do. You think you reach this point where you're just going to sail through and uh, that doesn't really happen. But I think it's beautiful that we have this challenge that constantly refines us um, so we don't get stagnant and we don't get stuck in one spot and think, this is it, this is how I'm always going to be, but realizing that we have this untapped potential and there's so much within us. We are like this endless, bottomless container. <laughs> I suppose that's constantly changing and um, just the complexity, when we think about the complexity of how humans react to everything in the environment and the not only the environment, but the internal environment that we hold as well, um, I think is just incredible. And getting to know ourselves, I think, um, is the greatest, um, I think is the greatest service we can do 
for humanity is getting to know ourselves, being present with who you are, uh, not what you think others perceive or how you might be showing up to the world, but just being present with who am I? Like, what is it that I value and stand for? Um, and what is it that I, I want to pursue, to leave a legacy on and to to show or, or leave for others? Yeah, I think it's so key. Yeah, and, and it reminds me of, uh, you know, that uh, the, that series of articles are all about the village of the me's. Right? It's like you have many, you have many yous <laughs> that live in you <laughs> and, and you sort of have to, you know, you have to address them. Kind of like a, a similar example would be Barbie. You know, like if you've seen the Barbie movie, you'd see that there's many forms of, of Barbie that are associated with how Barbie is showing up, uh, but they're all just the same Barbie. And, and I think uh, it's very, this is the same for us. And I think sometimes when we are being one of those, you know, me's or you's, uh, we kind of get lost in it and we get sort of like trapped there for a moment because as we were saying the other day, if you ask somebody to introduce themselves, uh, it's like the way you introduce yourself. It can be a, an endless list of things if you're referencing, you know, the kind of things you do, like all the use, right? It's like, I'm this person who does this, I'm this person who does this. And it's like what I was trying to do at the beginning. It's like, it's an endless list of uh, items. And some of them are things you stop doing and some of them are things you're yet to start doing. Um, however, like you're saying there, it's like, what is that uh, underlying, you'd say, character that cuts through across all of these uh, aspects where you're participating? And I think getting in touch with that and knowing the signature of what that is, it can be very helpful in sort of like giving you a ground on which to, let's say, stand and uh, and know. Uh, where to come back to it sort of like becomes the home of that of the of all the me's that you it's like the, that ideal you'd say position where everything comes back to for you and i think getting really familiar with that uh is very very essential because then now you can stop let's say identifying yourself as someone who brushes their teeth it's like that is an activity you do right <laughs> You don't need, uh, it's not something that, it's not the only thing that you are, or the, the only thing you participate in, yeah? You know, I'm not the, uh, I'm, I'm a mobile phone user, right? Should I only constrain myself as that? And I think uh, that would be limiting uh, uh, my potential and, and who I am. And so, like we're saying, uh, you know, recently, we get trapped in the, in the knowledge, right? In the knowledge of things, and and that you know goes back to uh, the the wages of uh, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's like when you get trapped in knowledge, you sort of like lose uh, the ability to sort of like follow the essence of what something is about and so you can't easily be trapped there uh, and so you could you know be so drawn to let's say the, the the image of being a mobile phone user that that's the only thing you ever want to be but but like you know you've just shared this like we're not we're very we're very dynamic and, and we have to be dynamic because we're ever changing on the inside and our outside is always changing and we are called to be in the optimal place where we can contend with all these changes and that's going to require us to be very many things and show up in very many ways um, so that we can contend with all these things uh, but if we sort of like lose track of that then we're going to get trapped we're gonna get stuck and uh, sort of uh not be able to shift when we need to shift and that 
that sort of can be a limiting problem and that can lead us to a, uh, what I would maybe categorize as uh, an unnecessary suffering uh, that didn't need to happen, but it does happen. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, and it happens too often because, like, it's just a simple question of, hey, how are you? Um, we often think about how we're feeling, right, when someone asks us that question. And so we go in and we're like, oh, I'm feeling crap today. But that's not who you are. Um, or the question of, hey, what do you do? And all of a sudden we identify with that thing that we're doing or sometimes find it really difficult to answer that question. And then the ego steps in, right, when the ego wants to sound better than maybe our life really is. And so we make up this incredible position that we do and yeah I'm a, I'm a nurse and I'm a this and that and um, I went through this dilemma for a while where I just couldn't really settle on what is it that I'm going to tell people when they ask what I do because I do so many different roles but I didn't feel like I am those different roles because mm. of the essence of who I am I'm the same person that shows up in those different roles but learning how to walk that out and to be consistent in terms of bringing your essence to every single role and every single um, area of your life is a difficult task um, because it requires a lot of self search, right? You search within yourself. Am I present right now? Am I the essence of one right now? The one that was created in, a, in the identity of, of, of God? Um, or am I trying to be a certain um, type of person within this role? Uh, like as a mother, sometimes I might perceive that I need to show up as very strong and authoritative and, you know, knowing it all and making sure I answer every question and fix every problem or within our roles at work, we might want to show up as the smartest in the room and be the most effective and efficient and, um, you know, most productive. Right. And so we tend to take on the characteristics of roles and not really search within us to who am I, what are the qualities that I behold, the strengths mm -hmm. that I have. Um, and it's the same like with my students, they struggle in that when you give them feedback or when we receive, anyone receives feedback or they receive something in terms of another person justifying or, um, you know, make it, maybe um, making a comment on the character or something they do, we tend to hold on to that as if, oh, this is my identity, like I failed at that. Um, if the feedback is negative, we're like, oh, I, I'm terrible, I can't do, you know, X, Y, Z. But it's not about that. Um, and I think for too long we've been trained to identify with the things we do, the things we show up in. Uh, and it's been interesting for me to watch because I've stepped into so many different roles throughout my career. But it's been interesting to watch, you know, when at the end of the day, when people come out of their, their jobs and their roles and, they, and they're walking out through the, the doors into the real world and they become something else. And all of a sudden, it just, I mean, I've had so many instances where there's just been this moment of bliss of like, we all as nurses would walk out of the hospital, that main door. And all of a sudden, it's like we see each other in a different light and we all just become human. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, that person's not my manager anymore. Uh, that person's not my superior anymore. They're not my inferior. They're not my anything. And it's like, oh, we're just all human. Wow. Okay. And that can be uncomfortable and confronting. Because we like, or our ego really likes, and be, you know, to be, um, it enjoys to be identified as something great and amazing and achieving and all of those things. Um, but when our ego is stripped of that, it's a really uncomfortable place to be. And because we've fed it for so long, we don't know how to be. So it becomes really awkward and we get really uncomfortable. And then because we get so uncomfortable and awkward, we don't tend to have the most fulfilling relationships because I don't need you to see my junk. I just need you to see what I say about myself. I want you to see what I'm capable of within a different environment. But if you were to come to my home and see how I live, you might not perceive me in the same light because now you know maybe what my house looks like or the fact that I don't have a lot of money in my bank account or the fact that I don't drive that really cool car or whatever it is that I've identified as extremely important. And, you know, so, yeah, I, I think it's so essential to go back to the essence of who we are, um, be true to ourselves, but also live with integrity and honesty about what it is that we are rather than what it is that we want to be or want to show up as. Um, and that can be a really complex process um and i don't think we do it very well as uh, as a human race 
because you know it's always been about and and the ego is so difficult to fight right in every situation it shows up here and maybe you're able to conquer it for a, a while and then it shows up in this other aspect and you wonder why you did or said whatever you did and said um but it's one of those things that you're constantly having to go back to and search within you who am i am i true am i showing up as myself am i in my loving presence am i in my authentic um being and am i connected to the essence of who i am because that's when i can give wholeheartedly that's that's when i'm not concerned about the self i'm not concerned about the ego i'm able to then serve others i'm able to then give back i'm able to then really be there for others and and be that um you know refreshing strengthening um person for another person right um i show up with a different um like uh, you know aura if i can use the word you know yeah. the, the thing that i give to others and they feel within me and my ability to just be present i, I show up differently yeah uh wow and, and and i'm in complete agreement with you know everything you've shared there because well one thing that now stands out is um that person you know we like to speak of the personal and being a person and it reminds me of um a uh, personhood uh, a phrase i picked up from uh john vaveki's work and um and yeah and he 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 references uh you know jesus studying his mission and what in his terms uh, he says that when jesus set out to go do what he was doing he was sort of like giving a piece of himself to those people that needed him and so it's like he would he would give the person that he is to them and 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 that that was uh inexhaustible right and and it's the same for us i think it's it's inexhaustible and i think uh like in christian teaching we're called to do this to give of ourselves to uh to the others that need us and so we're required to sort of like be very flexible in shaping ourselves in such a way that we can be of service to those that need a service in that situation uh, in such a loving and caring way and so you know what that also means is like we have to do that for ourselves there's that saying about charity starting at home uh, it's like you cannot give you cannot give that which you don't have so you have to sort of like first cultivate it by actually <laughs> giving it to you uh so you, you you have to cultivate this person before you even give the person away uh and share them uh and so it's a big call and and you know some of the things you've said there like you know it will take that awareness that sort of uh being very uh sensitive to what is changing around you how is it changing and 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 how how are you responding to all those changes and how are you uh learning and growing and and you know a lot of looking inward and cultivating those relationships with your ego for example it's like oh, the the ego is not an accident like we shouldn't be killing it <laughs> we should be learning how to work with uh what it's there for and 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 sort of like situate it uh where it needs to be doing what it needs to be doing and then we can get the best of it instead of being combative with the ego and then it's uh you know it's an unnecessary suffering as i would say and so yeah for me i completely agree with all that and i find that uh even getting through everyday challenges like you 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 have to to always be paying attention in this way like you you're going to have to reorient uh how you're pointing your attention such that uh you can always be moving with it and staying with the beat of the life that is playing around you if I may call it that way uh and without doing that uh you know it's going to be difficult to recover if you fall off right if you fall off that 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 path um 
it takes a lot more work and sometimes you see people give up like this happens like you know you everybody gets trouble right everybody gets knocked off their feet uh like they'll say like champions are the ones who did not stop getting up yeah it's like dude yeah don't stop getting up find a way to get up and keep keep you know uh, trying to figure out where you need to be and how to be there uh so yeah that that was uh beautifully shared and so uh the other thing i think that i touched on earlier is like you know getting trapped in the knowledge i think requires uh us to sort of like learn to see through that knowledge that knowledge of what we're doing and and who we are being and such that we can see the moreness of of who we are and other than the just the the snapshot of what we look like we're being because uh every now and then you get you can easily get uh what is it lost in your head <laughs> you usually get lost in your head thinking like you know you're coming across a certain way or doing something a certain way but in actual sense uh it's very different outside of you and so that always leads to unnecessary trouble and i think learning to see through those images and learning to see them for what they are and you know it allows us to be in the correct relationship with them or what was it, what was the better terms like being the right relationship with them because when you're in the right relationship then you are exactly how far or how close you need to be and that will allow you to get the most out of that relationship that you need to get out without breaking all the other relationships that you have to maintain with all the other you know situations that are going on around you and i think it takes a lot of a great deal of practice uh to learn this and 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 developing and and recently i learned that you know i always believed you know growing up they told us you, there's only five senses right <laughs> like there's your sight smell uh taste what's the other one touch, uh, touch yeah uh and hearing right and uh, uh, and so at a school you know, the children's parent night, uh, they brought in these speech therapists who were describing to us and saying, oh, there's actually, they found three more senses that need to be cultivated, especially at an early age. Uh, and they were talking about a sense of balance. It's like, you know, you need to really know how to balance yourself. And, and you know, that will come in like, you know, things like riding a bike or uh, standing up properly like knowing how to maintain your balance it, it, it's a whole sense of its own uh they were speaking about a sense of um uh i don't remember the correct term but it had to do like um uh, your the, the felt sense of of your you know your internal being sort of like how where, where sensations come from right uh or what you'd call the gut feeling. It's like, it's, yeah, it's another kind of sensitivity that we have to be paying attention to. Like there's data there that we need to be processing that helps us situate ourselves. You know, like uh, uh, the other one was the sense of position, like knowing where in space to be, how to stand in a place. It's like, those are extra things now we sort of like have to be working on along with the other five. The, <laughs> you'd say the, the standard five. But all these together, all these senses, all these senses are meant to uh, help refine us, help situate us the way we need to be situated, and and they're just giving us data to work with. Uh, I was watching a, a, a talk with uh, uh, I think Sad Guru, and, and he mentioned like you know all the five senses are pointing outwards, and I think. Uh, now the studies show like there are also these other internal senses that we need to be paying attention to, uh, which are going to help us sort of like keep up with the change that's emerging within. And the external facing uh, senses are going to help us to keep up with the changes happening outside of us, such that we can be in the optimal place and relate in the, in the optimal way. And I'll, and I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, and I feel like when you got to the end of that and you were explaining how the senses point outwards, I feel like, you know, recent times, 
there's this pull where God is saying, you guys need to come back to what was the most important thing, and that is to look at within you, right? Um, <clears throat> and so I feel this shift where people are discovering um, and sensing the desire and need to look within. And so those senses, those extra senses you were describing there, I think are very key to this uh, time in humanity where uh, we're seeing more and more people wanting to get in touch or needing to get in touch with who they are. And so looking within and having that sense of balance, what does balance mean for me rather than what does balance mean for a community? Because that's very different. Um, and I really appreciate that that concept that you shared there um, because I think it is a com complex um, and I think it's a complex concept to grasp. And I think because of the way that we've been living for so long, it's made it complex. We seem so far removed from who we are because we've attached to so many external things and so many external roles. And, and like you mentioned about the knowledge um, aspect of that, um, it was mind blowing for me as uh, I was reading through Eckhart Tolle's uh, book and to realize, I just, you know, when I read that line about the, the verse he shares from the Bible about the tree of good and evil, um, and he shares about how knowledge can corrupt. And I really had to sit with that and meditate on that. And what does that mean? Because for so long, I was just like, you know, it's about choice, right? It's about knowing what is right and knowing what's wrong and not doing those things. But I think it's also more than that. And what we're not paying attention to is how our brain processes information and the way in which we actually have a choice in which information we hold on to and make it our holy grail and which information we actually let go of and go, nah, that's that's not what I think, not what I believe. Um, and so what we're doing is often going to our um, psychological or neurological function for answers for life and not tapping into our essence deep within us that doesn't require the mind to always be thinking and analyzing because the mind has limits and it has restrictions in, in terms of how it analyzes information and how it processes and then passes the information and distributes it to the different spheres of the brain. And the different spheres of the brain have their capacity within certain restrictions again, in terms of how they're going to store information, how that information then is utilized in, in later need, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that we will often gather information and be like, oh, like I remember for myself, for example, so many times I would read a book and get super excited about all the concepts shared and be like, this is it. This is how I'm to live my life. This is gonna make me. And then you go to the next book and you're like, oh, the last book didn't say about this. And, oh, and so, you know, as I began to read more and more, I realized actually all the books have something great to say and there's an essence of truth in all of them. But at the end of the day, it's about who you as a person believe and the values you cultivate and focus on that then will um, cause you to accumulate the knowledge that you feel serves the purpose you were born to do. Mm. I truly mm. believe that uh, because what's the purpose of uh, acquiring knowledge if we're not going to use the knowledge, right? And so the knowledge is there to be used for us to serve, whether we serve ourselves or serve others, but it has a, it should have a transitional purpose in that it's not just being stored, but it's actually being in, put into practice. And knowledge changes us as you think about things that you've read or you think about experiences you've had and you're meditating and, you know, contemplating on those things. It changes not only the brain and the function, but it changes the mood. It changes the behavior that then we put out. And so knowledge has the power to corrupt and has the power to also build. Um, and so how we choose knowledge and how we what we choose to expose ourselves to is really important. So that was for me really striking, like, oh my goodness, I never actually realized that it's how knowledge is disseminated. How is knowledge pulled apart and utilized? How is it thought of? How am I going back to the knowledge that I've acquired and putting it into practice? Because I can use it for good and I can use it for evil. It's just like a, you know, a weapon. You can choose to do good with it and you can choose to do terrible with it. And so I just thought that was incredibly, um, you know, just an aha moment for me as I was reading through that and going, oh, I would need to be more careful what I expose myself to, what I mm. allow my brain to see because the brain only has, you know, certain capacities. And so it will replay 
right? It replays the things that I'm exposing myself to. And eventually over time, within the subconscious mind, it will think back on those things when difficult situations arise or I'm finding myself in a um, really difficult um, maybe decision-making process. And so all the emotions, all the things I've cultivated, everything I've put in is then going to rise to the surface and it's now fighting for me to acknowledge as it as truth or not truth. So knowledge is not only power, but it can also be destructive. It's so cool that, you know, to realize that concept of how do we filter through knowledge and select the knowledge that will serve us? Yeah. Yeah, that that's really beautiful. And, you know, while you're sharing that, it, it's sort of like, you know, the, the idea sort of like emerged to me that it seems as if like n- n- knowledge is a, uh, a snapshot of a truth and and it could be you know like in Vaveki's terms he would call that like a proposition of truth it's like a truth about something uh but you would have to like bring it back to life you have to decompress oh yeah decompress that you know that nugget of knowledge right that you you sort of like bubbled there and I think the true learning is in the insights that you unlock as you as you reanimate this frozen knowledge and and bring it back to life. It, the effort that you expend and the journey that you take to do that becomes now it, it sort of like unlocks and gifts you what it held. And I guess that's that's the way to engage with it. But uh, you know, with living in a modern capitalistic culture where there's a lot of consumption, um, there's a lot of need to have. And so you can collect a, a bunch of, of books, right? Like there's so many people writing books. There's so much nuggets of knowledge on the, uh, on, on, on the OG Rose channel on the net. The other day we we're talking about uh, self-help. It's like, you know, is that like, a, is that something uh, that is helpful, and in my opinion, like it's all, it all depends on how you consume it and how you uncompress it and how you you apply it. Now, it's definitely gonna have some truth in it because, for like personally, I and this is just my model of how I see things, but I personally believe like anything that is able to exist has a certain. Uh, amount of wisdom in it that allows it to exist and that that amount of wisdom is the truth in it and so you to see the value of it you have to sort of like figure out what that is what is it that makes this thing or this being or whatever exist and the what that answer is would be the the wisdom that allows for that and i think in in all the snapshots of knowledge, uh, there is a bit of wisdom, there is a bit of truth, but it has to be filtered out and, you know, reanimated and be brought back to life. And and the way we humans being uh, we human beings at least uh, do this is through a situation. You know, uh, Daniel from Wojirose would say the same. It's like we have to engage in situational, uh, you know, life is in the situations, right? We, we have to participate in a situational way. Uh, and, and so it's in the situation that you get to unlock experience. That's when you get to now start to engage, like, you know, your, 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 your spirit gets drawn out into the spirit of the experience. And then together, something happens. And whatever that something happens is the thing that can be transformative. That's the knowledge that you needed to actually get. And I think when you don't, uh, when you don't do that, then it's sort of like it's sort of like a door that is just not a door. It's like you, you, you there was a there was a door, but you couldn't open it and get through. Uh, and 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 so, yeah, that's those are some of the thoughts that have come up. It's sort of like very interesting in that way. 
Mm. I love it because you're right in that knowledge doesn't only show up in books um, and in the situation. There is also the dynamic of um, this I mean, there's different dynamics when you're experiencing something rather than just reading something, right? Uh, a lot of the times when we're reading or consuming information, it's the intellect that's involved. It's the, the, the brain matter that's involved in selecting, identifying, trying to convey meaning to things. Um, but when you're in a situation, it's like your whole being is involved. And so the dynamics of your sen felt sensation, your, your felt thinking, the context, uh, of where you find yourself, all of those things then allow you a greater understanding and a greater experience of the mm. experience, right? And so you not only perceive understanding and acquire knowledge by being present, but also through the different senses, you then digest that knowledge further. Um, and I think it's so wonderful when we do have experiences. And I think, you know, it, often when you go for a job interview, depending on the role, they'll often look at your experience, right? Because there's nothing can buy experience. If you've been in a role and you've done something for a long time and you know you've been successful in it, then oftentimes you'll be selected um, over those who haven't had any experience in it. Because experience just gives you a depth of understanding and capability that knowledge alone will not give you. Um, no matter what, you know, year, era era we're living in right <laughs> it's always going to come back to that lived experience of this person's going to be um trustworthy within that role we know that we can have confidence because they will perform based on lived history um right that we have and i think there's something to be said there in terms of not just reading things and acquiring knowledge but let us be present and experience things and expose ourselves to those experiences uh, more often. Um, because if we don't, we're living really just removed from the felt sensation and the greater depth of um, being present with life itself, right? I mean, a lot of the times we don't do certain or live certain experiences. Like, let's say a lot of people might not skydive. Well, it's because of fear or whatever else that the reasons might be. But when you do skydive, it's like you can speak about that differently to someone who might mm. just have seen someone else do it, right? Um, and I see this with nursing as well. When we're in a health uh, sort of position, you see a lot of the times that students, for example, the other week we were arguing about this one question on an ass assignment where it asked about them placing themselves within the context of a small clinic in a rural setting and the students could not grasp the concept because they're like, well, I've, I've never been there. What does, what does that mean? I, mm. I can't, you know, give you the answer that this is looking for and trying to convey that the question is all asking more about the critical thinking and ability to think outside the box was really difficult um, because they could not place themselves in that context and identify the things that would happen there because they don't have experience of it. Yeah. So experience sometimes will trump knowledge and uh, with our students for sure when it comes to health and certain roles of course not just within health but there are certain roles we still see you know apprenticeships being um, uh, undertaken because we know that there's something different in terms of understanding and depth of um, capability that comes out of someone being hands-on mm. and actually performing the task and practicing the task um, and so with nursing, we see that definitely makes a difference when students can be within the context of nursing, they can be immersed in the experience itself rather than just from a, you know, theoretical base talk about it. Um, so, yeah, I really appreciate that distinction of this is the knowledge we can acquire by reading and, you know, watching something, but it's so different to when you actually live it out. Yeah, it's it's, it's really different you know and it's part of the inspiration you know the lived quality right i i, I i'm a strong believer in that it's it, the lived experience is really really uh it stays with you longer it, it has this whole sort of like shapes you it shapes how you go forward you're not going to go forward uh in life the way you used to before this experience and so yeah like you know we talk about another thing that's sort of coming up for me is that 
knowledge in itself seems to be like a tool, right? But experience is how you use that tool to bring about, you know, a different experience, how you influence reality using this tool to extend reality or shape a new reality uh, uh, that, you know, you can participate in. And I think knowing the distinction between that and being able to uh, hone these skills allows you to unlock the power of the tool, right? And and so without, I'm not saying like the, 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 the tool is not helpful. I mean, the tool is helpful only if you know how to use it. Like, for example, if you never learned how to drive, and the only thing that is going to save your life is if you sit in the car and drive it off, then the car is useless. It's, it's not going to help you because you don't know what to do with it, right? Uh, and, you know, I could go through a, a set of examples, but it's, it's, it's kind of like that. If you know how to wield the tool, then you can reshape your reality uh, using the tool. Because now you know how to wield this tool and use it. And we all have different, uh, you'd say, capacities of how we use these tools to unlock new realities. And some people are going to be more excellent than others. Um, but there's a, there's a requirement for being able to do that. And I think like not getting locked in the knowledge itself and sort of like moving from knowing about to actually knowing how uh, that may start to unlock how we experience and and I think all the all, you know like all the teachings and the books will tell you about this like the if the knowledge is just in the book it's just going to stay there like it doesn't matter how many books you read if you don't know how to apply that stuff then you may as well not have read them, right? Because it's just sitting in your head there. Maybe you, you increase the potential for some insights to come up for you uh, later. And and that's, that's great. But until then, uh, you're sort of like, you don't know how to apply it. It reminds me of a, a scene from uh, uh, one of the Dune movies, I think the more recent one. Um, this character, uh, what's his name, Timothy Chalamet, the, the character he's playing of Paul, uh, has to live with desert people. And he read about how those people live, right? Like he read from uh, uh, anthropologists, they described this world to him and how it should be and how you walk on the sand and what you do. But when he's doing it, according to what the book told him, uh, the you know the locals uh, tell him no you're doing it wrong, and so they they take him through an experience. They say look this is how you step, and the point is to break your rhythm, and this is what your rhythm feels like in real life when you're applying it, and this is how you break it, and you have to do that because there's a worm that lives under the sand that's listening for uh, <laughs> a pattern, and if it gets that pattern, it's gonna come up and eat whatever wherever that pattern is coming from. So you have to like really uh, work on this. And he lands it, but then he's reflecting back and goes like, yeah, this is not exactly how I was taught. It's like I, he consumed the knowledge, but in trying to apply it, he found that, yeah, it did not translate directly. And even if he applied it directly, it did not, it wasn't successful. But you forget sometimes that the person who is packaging this knowledge into a nugget that can be consumed is speaking from their interpretation, the point in time where they are, the conditions around them, and that all that factors in. It's like that knowledge is coming from that. Uh, for it to, uh, to unfold in that exact same similar way, you have to re-magic all those other unspoken aspects of the context for it to resurface the same way. And even when you do that, it's most likely not going to because time has changed. Uh, so this is why even like, you know, for the scientists doing experiments, it's so hard 
to uh, reproduce uh, the results of an experiment in the exact same way repeatedly. And so there's always a range <laughs> within which, like, if, if the results you're getting are within this range, then that's okay because they have to account for the ever continuing, uh, the, the, the ever emerging difference in, in circumstances. And so they look for the essence of, of whatever it is they're testing for, which should be within a particular range. And I think, like, uh knowledge uh is the same it's sort of like a, it's like a it's a range it's like it's open to interpretation uh but the, the, the whatever is going to emerge from that interpretation and that processing is definitely going to be something different from from what it originally was and yes it may it, it should be better right or it should be a step up but it could also be a step down so like what do they say? Take it with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Take it with a pinch of salt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was so cool because it brought me back to, um, you know, I think that knowledge is um, such a complex thing to unpack, and we're finding that in this conversation, in that it's so much more than just words. And when we then apply it, as you mentioned, it can look so different. And I think also it comes down to perspective. It comes down to how the person um, used certain filters. We're not often conscious of our filters and how we might be able to, you know, absorb and interpret information. But I remember one example where, like, a policy stated that within a certain airport, they had to check the baggage, um, you know, if the person, yeah. It, the, so you would go through the customs and it would check your baggage through the screens um, the little cameras that scan your baggage and then they would let you go through. Um, but every, there was something like every 20 minutes, make sure that, you know, the customer has been checked. And so there was a holdup, um, in terms of processing people through fast enough and the 20 minutes was up. So, you know, one of the security guards said, oh, now we have to send you back to the end of the line. And now we're going to recheck your bags and put them through. And it's like, no, knowledge, like a policy is there to serve you, not to harm you, right? It's there to provide some boundaries and restrictions so that we all act in a civil way. But again, looking at that policy, how he perceived it was, well, 20 minutes is up, so now I need to reassess what where you're at. But the person was standing right in front of him and passed the screens, right? And so mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not like that person has accumulated anything extra in their baggage during that time. Um, it's interesting because I think it comes down to how we perceive perspective is everything and how we allow ourselves to be flexible towards the knowledge that we receive. Now, I don't necessarily like flexible word anymore because sometimes when we think about knowledge, um, if we're saying I'm going to be flexible to something, it might also imply that we're going to be open to something that we not, don't necessarily want to be open to. Um, but I mean, in the sense of look at knowledge as there to serve you and an object in initially unpack that like you said it's it's compressed it's just flat words but unpack that and expand it to find meaning um and and you know allow it to go through the logical process of our thinking to then apply that meaning to it like is it you know does it make sense for me to put these people through the bend again does it does it make sense for them to be scanned again when they were standing right in front of me that's going to be a waste of time it's going to be a waste of resources um and it's going to cause frustration and anger right um and so i think yeah there's the the there's the knowledge there's how we take the knowledge um our subconscious mind will filter knowledge for each one of us differently um i remember often uh when i was very you know rigid to how information was perceived i would often react very quickly to knowledge and not allow it to sort of sit with me um in particular when there was anything against me right when you're receiving maybe a, a not so nice email uh, or some feedback you don't really like and so you react to it only to realize later actually oh that's not what it's saying right because i'm acting from my subconscious and something's being triggered and so when we have knowledge it's there to serve a purpose if we can recognize the purpose, but then also have the capability to say, how do I perceive this knowledge? How is it landing with me and allow myself to be then processing through that, you know, being aware of my subconscious and the thoughts and the perceptions and the perspectives that I bring, the filters that are there. Um, 
and then saying, well, okay, how do I become objective, um, removed from the uh, knowledge in terms of my felt sensations? Um, because sometimes we can, you know, wrap ourselves around an ideal and be like, oh, this is, this is it. <laughs> but it's not. You know, knowledge is there to be used and it's going to be used in different circumstances differently. I mean, people would use language that was, um, you know, back in the, you know, other eras it was used just to describe food and now we, we can use it to describe other concepts as well, right? So there's that transition of knowledge as well um, and, and I think we need to identify that when things are said, it's our responsibility to then you know, think about or really filter through how that knowledge is landing and how am I storing that knowledge and then using that knowledge um, yeah. to, to do something with it, right? Yeah, totally. I, we have to process it. We have to process it. Another thing that's sort of like you just spoke about food and I was reminded about recipes, right? Uh, how many times do we buy recipe books and, and then go off to try and remake the creation in the recipe book only for it to turn out <laughs> not exactly as you imagined it was going to taste or even looking at all close to the thing that that you're trying to recreate. And and it's so funny because the, the recipe book gives you all these details, right? And it's only during the implementation when you're trying to actually recreate it that, that the questions start to come up. It's like, oh, they said, well, heat up the oven to 200 degrees. Which kind of setting is it, you know, like fun, fun heating? Is it just convectional heating or is it grilled heating? It's like, oh, the, in some cases, the, the author will be polite and, and be specific. But then it's like, in which place, right? <laughs> because all those things have an effect on, on how it's going to work and how it's going to turn out. And, and so... I was asking, uh, you know, my wife the other day, uh, a few a few years ago, to, to explain to me how to to make a bread, right? How do you need the bread? And she gives me these instructions, and she goes like, "Well, you make sure it's not too soft or it's not too hard. It should be just right." I mean, like, what is what is that even? Like, I get you. It's been articulated. I think. But just right for me is probably going to be not the same for you or for someone else. And so there's a lot of work that has to happen for, for that knowledge to sort of like release uh, the gift that it's holding. And I think sometimes just consuming it, you know, verbatim and, and sort of like going that you know, because it says so, right? You know, like the definition says this, therefore that must be it, is I think sort of missing the point and sort of not unlocking um, what it's meant to be uh, putting forth. So, yeah, th there's work to be done. There's lots of work to be done in unlocking knowledge. And and probably you as an educator, you would you would probably experience this a lot when your students misunderstand, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the material and, and end up doing uh, something that is not, that was never intended. But, you know, everybody open, is open, uh, you know, to interpret things how they come to them. And I think that is where the wages come in. It's like <laughs> when you, when you are, you know, overly relying upon just knowledge, you're, yeah, you're just going to die because it's like your world will get frozen uh, to just a smidget of information and then you'll be stuck there. Then you won't be able to leave that spot or you won't be able to unlock what it has to offer you and so it won't be useful. Uh, there's many ways to interpret that, but at least that's one of the things that like really, really stood out to me uh, when I, you know, when I was uh, listening to John Milton's um, Lost, uh, Paradise, Paradise Lost. And so it's very, very, it, it's very interesting that even when it seems to be like a gift, it's like, oh, I got all these books 
and I did some work to read them. It's like, yeah, that was the first step of, of doing that work. You have to, now you have to take that and and apply it and apply it in a way that is uh, experiential such that now you unlock all that it was trying to hold for you. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I, I found that to be quite different and quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know, language and um, the the concept of knowledge is such a complex thing, and we we're finding that in this conversation as we're talking more and more about it. There's so many facets to it, and you mentioned within my teaching. Well, I have so much difficulty sometimes explaining things um, so that the st- the student will understand it from the perspective of what the question's asking on an assessment, for example. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's so much involved in this, in that, you know, we could really talk about it at length. Um, but I think it's, it's the way that we use words it's the way that we use knowledge that really will draw the most, um, essence out of it. Uh, and we mentioned about lived experience. Well, when we're utilizing that knowledge and putting into practice, it gives us again, a different dimension of understanding. Um, that will serve us even even greater. Um, and so I just love how this, you know, conversation has sort of gone in the different directions and exposed the different facets of knowledge. And I think it's fascinating that we have this understanding and the capability to acquire knowledge and to put it into practice. Um, and I think the true essence of the power of knowledge comes down to trialing it, trial it in different contexts and put it to practice, put it to work for you. Whatever it is that you need in terms of knowledge to acquire, uh, maybe it's for a job, maybe it's for your career, maybe it's just finding your purpose, then put it into practice and make it work for you um, and see it unfold, see it decompress so that then you can say, okay, Oh, and allow it then to grow within you because you need to also bring your full self to the experience and not be resistant, not be creating boundaries where you're like, well, this is the context with within which it's going to operate, or this is the this is the only knowledge I'm gonna I'm gonna expose myself to. Like I remember when I started reading different books that um, I thought initially were not aligned with my values and my beliefs. And I remember the fear that I would, you know, feel or the condemnation because of the way that I lived for such a long time and that restriction of this is all we are about. Um, But when you then open that up and you're like, well, I have the capability and power to select what it is that I allow in terms of that knowledge that I'm reading into to be with me or to be a part of me, right? I have that choice. Um, Then that opened up a whole new world of understanding that, as you mentioned earlier, within every piece of literature and everything that we're exposed to when it comes to knowledge, there will be a truth. There will be some evidence of truth in there. Um, And so I think within us, if we're seeking truth and we're seeking to live an integral life, that will spring forth. And you'll have those, those aha moments when you, when those truths appear uh, in front of you. And so don't be rigid when you're reading into something and don't be constrained by what, by what may seem like boundaries or restrictions, but then ask yourself as to how those are applied. And when you live out the experience, then allow yourself to see that knowledge can be molded into different forms of how it can be expressed, right? It's not just the one thing. Um, yeah, it's like nurses, right? We practice differently from each other, but we've learned the same knowledge, right? And so how we apply it, uh, to be more specific when it comes to the technique of giving an injection, you know, some may hold it with the two fingers, some may hold it with three, some may hold it with the whole hand, you know, we're all going to be different in terms of what fits and what makes sense and feels most comfortable and safe for us when we're giving that injection. Uh, at the end of the day, patient safety is paramount. So we really push that and make sure that it it is what we're aiming to achieve. Uh, but in terms of your skill that fits you, it's going to look different. And so it's the same with knowledge. I'm acquiring the same knowledge in terms of how the injection should be given, but I may utilize a different technique and that's okay. But I just really appreciate that we've been able to discuss, really look at the different facets of knowledge and how knowledge is 
to be absorbed, consumed, and then put into practice. So thank you so much, Clayton. That was brilliant. Thank you, Anna. It's always a pleasure. And I love how these things always go full circle. <laughs> yeah, so, look forward to the next one. <laughs> yeah, thank you.